Would you like to spend an insane amount of money to build something that you could just buy from a store for a much more reasonable price? Maybe? Well, if you answered yes to that question, then I have a first class ticket for you to the wonderful world of DIY keyboards. Because today, we are going to spend way too much money to build a custom keyboard that's not really any better than the one that I already have. In fact, it might be kind of worse. So at this point, you might be asking yourself why? Why would anybody spend three or four times the cost of a good high-end mechanical keyboard just to build their own? And I think that is a very reasonable question and one that I hope to answer by the end of this video by potentially wasting a bunch of my own money. So on that note, let's head over to the shop and we can discuss exactly what I spent in parts for on this build. It was a lot. All right, so laid out in front of me here, I have everything that I think we're gonna need for this build. Famous last words, right? Let's start with the basics. This is the hot swappable PCB. This is the brains of the operation that communicates directly with your computer, and it's also responsible for the backlighting. However, as is, it's not very functional, and that's because we need to add a bunch of key switches to it. These switches let the board know that, hey, the B key has been pressed, and you need to relay that information to the computer. Because this is a hot swappable keyboard, I can just plug these guys in there like that, and it's nice and simple. If it wasn't a hot swappable keyboard, I would have to solder on each one of these switches individually. Not the worst thing in the world, but it would definitely take a lot of time. So for beginners like myself, they usually recommend that you start with a hot swappable keyboard. As for switches, I chose the Cherry MX Browns. These are the key switches that I know and love. However, there are dozens of different options out there and each one provides a slightly different feel and sound signature to your keyboard. and it's kind of a thing and people get really sensitive about it. So I'm looking forward to all the nerds commenting in the comments about how I didn't choose the right switches. Next, you have the keycaps. These are the aesthetic face of your keyboard. They come in dozens of different profiles, textures, and of course, colors. This is where a lot of the customization happens on your keyboard. For my build, I chose this sweet cement gray themed set. Moving right along, we also have the plate, which is made from solid brass and also a bunch of stabilizers. But we'll talk more about these later when we actually get around to installing them because I'm sure what you wanna hear right now is how much all of this stuff costs. Well, at first, the sticker price on it wasn't too bad. I think it was 250 American dollars, but then everything had to come from China, so the shipping was kind of expensive. I think that was 60 bucks. And then of course, because I live in Canada, there was brokerage and duty fees that totaled something like $75. So by the time it was all said and done, I spent a hair under 500 Canadian dollars on what you see in front of you here. So yeah. It hurt. And also, the keen-eyed among you may have noticed that I conspicuously left one item off that list, the case. And that's because we are going to be making our own case today out of beautiful, solid walnut. Back at home, I came up with a design for the case. I have it loaded up on my laptop here. I have my brand new X-Carve Pro ready to go behind me with the materials in it. So the only thing left to do now is to press carve. This is another one of those projects where I was really happy to have the extra speed and power afforded by the X-Carve Pro. A keyboard case like this is a relatively simple carve, but it's still a lot of material to remove. Depending on what I'm cutting, I've found that my X-Carve Pro is as much as five times faster than my old regular X-Carve, which adds up pretty quick. All right, look at that. That looks very nice. For those of you who don't know, I've actually partnered with Inventables, the company that makes the X-Carve Pro, in order to show off some of the capabilities of it. And as you might imagine from the name, it is aimed at professionals and people who run businesses. So to that end, I'm actually going to make all of the files for this custom keyboard case available for free on their website. That way, if you wanna start a business making cool custom keyboard cases, you got a great jumping off point. All right, this looks pretty good, but uh, still gotta do some modifications to it. Make it a little fancier. First, I wanna soften the edges of this thing by giving it a slight chamfer the whole way around. So we're just gonna run through the rotor a couple times.
I'd also like to do that same chamfer on these outside corners. However, it's a little sketchy to do that over on the rotor table. So I'm just gonna do it here on the miner saw instead. And now finally, there's one last little thing that I wanna do here. Most keyboards actually sit at a little bit of an angle, something like that. I've got the planer set up behind me. I'm gonna find a way to make a sled that holds it at this angle, and then we're gonna run it through like that and uh, In order to stick the case to my sled, I use some very basic hot glue. Now, some of you may be wondering why I'm not using my cordless hot glue gun that I made a video about recently, and that's because I ran out of glue sticks for it. So I just use this older crappy one instead. Okay, now we just hope that that holds through the planer. Wish me luck. By running the case through the planer at an angle like this, I was able to remove layer after layer of wood until the bottom of the case was cut at approximately a 10 degree angle. Once I was done, I pried it off the sled, inspected my work, and then promptly had a little mishap off camera. Ah, well that sucks. I wanted to do a test fit of this board, and you might have noticed earlier I had these wood tabs to keep the PCB up off the bottom of the deck, and one of them broke off, so I just broke them all off, and we are going to replace them with these leftover motherboard standoffs from the Everything console. Problem solved. If you're new to my channel, you might not know that one of my favorite things to do is to use PCBs as templates for drilling holes. It works great, and for some reason, it really seems to rile up a certain type of commenter. I used each of these holes as a location to mount a brass standoff that elevated the PCB a few millimeters off the bottom of the case. And just to be safe, a little drop of CA glue in each hole really helped to fill out the threads and provide a more secure connection. After the standoffs were in place, it was time to test fit the board and then mark out the location of the USB port that I would, you know, use to plug the keyboard in later. The location of the hole had to be pretty accurate, so I used a series of progressively larger drill bits to do the job. That way, the center of the hole was exactly where I wanted it. All right, I got the circuit board back in here. Let's take a quick second and make sure this fits. Yes, we are good to go. All right, let's move on to finishing. Seeing as this is going to be my keyboard, I needed to make sure that it was well protected against Cheeto dust and Mountain Dew spills. I sanded the whole thing down to 220 grit, and then in an attempt to get the case to match my desk, I brushed on a few coats of the same finish that I used on my desk. All right, that is looking really nice. Finish is dry. So it's getting a little late in the shop here, so I'm gonna take this guy home and uh, wrap it up tomorrow morning at home. We'll get all the internals installed. We'll get it functional, test it out, and see if it's really worth $500. All right, so here we are back at home, and we are now ready to start assembling the electronic and mechanical components of this keyboard. And also, we're gonna talk about a few of those things from earlier in the video that we left for later. The first of which is going to be the key stabilizers, or as the cool kids in the keyboard scene call them, stabs. It's kind of aggressive, but you know what? I like it. So what do these do? Well, it's actually quite a simple concept. You see, some keys on the keyboard are quite a bit bigger than others, but you still only have a single switch for them. So when you put them on that switch, you end up with areas like this where you can press down on them and nothing really happens. So the stabilizers or stabs stabilize the input pressure across the entire key and make it function no matter where you press it. Now, unfortunately, there is a little catch with stabilizers and that's that they come dry from the factory. And in order to get nice smooth motion out of them, you really need to lubricate them. So as we install these ones, we are going to lubricate them with a little bit of dielectric grease. Hopefully I don't get taken off of YouTube for showing something so graphic. <laughs> As with all things lubrication related, I would definitely err on the side of too much rather than too little. Uh, a nice little brush like this, actually, if you could get a smaller one than this, that would be ideal. But a brush like this is great for just removing any excess and kind of spreading the lubrication around. And yes, I did actually steal this brush from my girlfriend, but we just won't tell her about that. All right, moving on to the plastic parts. So here you have one small piece sitting inside of a larger piece. What you're gonna to wanna to do is take your lubed up brush and just get a little bit of lubrication inside of the bigger piece, something like that. And now we're just gonna rinse and repeat that same process for all of our stabilizers. And 
And now you just take the metal bar, drop it into the plastic switch, and then it should just kind of click into position like that. Perfect. So I got these screw-in style ones as opposed to clip-in style ones because I heard they're just a little bit more stable. So I'm gonna go ahead and screw this on here. Oh, lost the screw. And you'll note that I have a little plastic washer on these screws just to keep it from shorting out the board in any way. Probably not really necessary, but hey, it's a nice little precaution. Okay, space bar is done. And we're done. So because this keyboard is relatively small, I only actually have three stabilizers, but with a larger board, you would have more. Now, moving right along, we are going to talk about the plate now. So one of the downsides to having a hot swappable PCB is that the switches aren't actually, you know, in the board that well. So part of the thinking with the plate is that you link all of your switches together through this brass plate. So you take your switch, you click it into here, and then we will lower them onto the board. Sounds simple enough. Let's see if it really is. So from what I understand, it's best to do a couple of key switches around the perimeter of your plate and then worry about filling the rest in afterwards once you've got those pressed into the board. So let's do the corners like so. Okay, let's see if we can get those guys to slot in nicely. Yeah. That goes in there, that goes in there. Those ones go in, okay, so there we go. There's a plate, now let's populate the rest of these switches. Oh crap, I just realized that I actually have to mount the PCB inside the case before I put the plate on. So let's just try and carefully separate these and we'll take care of that real quick. This part of the build really made me appreciate just how handy magnetic screws and magnetic screwdrivers are. <laughs> these are not magnetic screws. Oh, they must be made out of aluminum or something. Come on. Damn these fat fingers of mine. Dropped it on the floor. This is riveting content that I'm sure will make it into the final edit. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Eventually, I did manage to get all the screws in place just in time to notice that I was missing something. Oh, I just realized I do actually have a fourth stabilizer I have to install for the left shift here. So I gotta take this all out and start again. Oh, this has been a good day so far. It's not that big a deal. Okay, quick pause over. Reinstalled the fourth stabilizer and now the plate goes back in. And then it was time to install the 75 or so individual key switches. I should point out that a number of my switches actually came with bent pins, so make sure you check each switch before plugging it in. It might just save you tearing down your board later when one of your keys doesn't function right. You know, at this point, this keyboard is actually 100% functional. It's just a little uncomfortable to use. So we are gonna fix that by installing some keycaps, except I'm gonna need more than the eight or nine that I have in front of me here, but good thing I have this big tray of hundreds of them right here. The tricky part about doing this is I don't actually know where, you know, the P key goes. I mean, intuitively I do. I can type without looking, I'm not an animal, but just where does it actually go on the keyboard? Thankfully, I have a nice little reference that I can use down here. This started out tricky, but as I went, it got easier and easier. I filled out all the special keys around the perimeter and then slowly worked my way inside. It probably would have been a lot easier if I didn't carelessly drop the box a few seconds ago, but hey, nobody's perfect. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we are done. And does that ever feel nice? I mean, yeah, we got to break in these stabilized keys a little bit, but the main ones, oh, they feel so good. Okay, so I'm gonna flip this over real quick and just put four little rubber feet on the bottom of it to keep it from sliding around and help dampen it just a little bit. There. All right, let's plug it in and see how it works. Oh, excited. 
All right, so it is a few minutes later. I removed my old keyboard. I got the new one set up. I loaded a custom firmware onto it with some key mapping and I took it for test spin. My initial impressions of it are quite good. Compared to my old board, this one is way quieter. It's quite a bit smoother and it also just feels way more solid. Here, let's do a quick sound test. Now, some of that probably comes down to the fact that this board has much newer switches, but it's also just way heavier duty construction. I also love how this thing looks. I mean, come on, you have the gray keycaps, you have the solid walnut case, and my favorite part, you have just a hint of brass poking out between all of the keys. So now for the real question, is this thing worth $500? More really if you properly account for my own time and all the materials that went into making the case. This one I'm a little bit torn on. For me personally, I had a lot of fun making this thing and I also got to learn a whole lot of stuff about keyboards, switches, and all sorts of things that I had no idea about before. And I also get to have this sweet looking keyboard that matches the rest of my setup perfectly. But $500 is a lot of money, like a lot, a lot. That's rent, groceries, maybe even a couple of car payments. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really function any different than a store-bought board. So unless you're at a pretty comfortable point in life and you don't mind spending a little bit frivolously, this probably wouldn't be the first DIY project that I tackle. All that said though, for me personally, I think it is worth it. I had an absolute blast making this thing. I learned so much and really it's everything that I would ever want in a keyboard in a single package. And really, what more could you ask for in a DIY project? Heck, I might even make a couple more of these in the future now that I know a thing or two about the whole process. So on that note, I would love to hear what you guys at home think. Would you build something like this? Or would you rather just buy one at the store like this and keep 400 bucks in your pocket? I don't know, it's a tough call. All right, everybody, that's it for me and this video. So. Thank you so much for watching. Big thank you to all my Patreon supporters who you can see listed over here. I will include links to everything that I use down in the video description. And as always, I will see you in the next video. It's B-roll time. <laughs>